Okay. Question one. How many of you would like to save approximately one crore in the next five years by investing just one lakh today? Please raise your hand if you agree to this. Okay? If you like this idea. Okay, great. How many of you want to improve their home entertainment in the next three months? Your home entertainment in the next three months. How many of you want to improve it? Please raise your hand. Okay. How many of you want to make the smartest investment this month that guarantees higher returns five years from now? How many of you really want to go for it? Please raise your hand. Okay. How many of you want an attention-free, hassle-free life and walk out of the bank happy, counting millions of rupees after you hit 60? How many of you want to do that? Please raise your hand. Okay. Now, the first speech, what I gave you, if I ask you this question, how many of you want to buy the new tax saver plan? How many would raise their hand? How many want to buy a new home theater? Straight question. Anybody? Just one. And I asked this question of many people who answered. How many of you want to buy a mutual fund? If it's a straight, straight question, you know, the straight question and the, you know, that's because you sell mutual funds. <laughs> this was about the pension plan. The Ethereum pitch is usually a pitch that you give to people, more like a teaser, that builds the interest of people, that builds the curiosity of people. So you can get a lot of volunteers who will respond to your marketing messages. It's like you put a teaser and people say, are you interested? And the person say, yeah, this sounds interesting to me. Because what you do here is you're ultimately talking about the benefit of what you're selling. So the person show interest, so he becomes a volunteer for you. When you ask such a, a stadium pitch, he becomes a volunteer. Now he's open to the idea to discuss more of the offer that you have for them. That's why, you know, Hitchcock always said, the terror is not in the bank, the terror is in the anticipation of the bank. So the anticipation, that curiosity, is how we can build. And we can build that through stadium pitch. It's also one great device, a great method to generate leads. So lead generation. If you are opening to a cold market, stadium pitches are one of the best ways to open up lead generation. But you're talking ultimately about the benefit, what it does to people, not what it is. You know iPod is not the first uh, MP3 player in the marketplace, but it's the first successful MP3 player in the marketplace. So a lot of companies, the Germans tried, the Japanese tried, the Singapore, they had creative, they came out with the iPod, uh, you know, MP3 players. But the strategy of iPod, when it was launched, they didn't tell it is an MP3 player, 2GB, all that just more words. They said, thousand songs in your pocket. How is that deal? Thousand songs in your pocket. If they didn't tell what it is, they said what it does. Sometimes when you give a pitch, it's very important what it does to you, ultimately, in talk, talk in terms of benefit to the customer. Not saying the features, the advantages, or all the technical stuff that you know so well, but ultimately, what's in it for me? That's a question for a customer. And that is selling ultimate benefit. That's where we use stadium pitch to generate interest with customers. Next, become a consultant. We are consultants. So when you are in the sales and consulting together, you become a consultant. What prime example he gave, what does a consultant do? What do they do? What do the consultants do? Are they experts, yes or no? Consultants are experts. People go to experts or amateurs. Experts. Experts have what? What do they have? Knowledge, information, expertise, judgment, predictability, market trend, future scope, everything. They know everything about their subject. So who are you? You're an expert consultant who gives information for free. And the more information you give free, 
people build what? A relationship with you? Right? So you made a friend, then a sale is made sooner or later. So they act like a consultant. The consultant is an expert who gives information for free and as much information as you can give away. As much information as you can give away. That's what a consultant does. They educate the prospects. In fact, one of the best sales methods that you can apply in your business is called education-based relationship selling. Educate the prospects, build the relationship, sell. Now here you don't really sell. You help a customer buy. You don't sell. You help a customer buy. You help a customer decide. You have given multiple information. You have given options. You have made your customer the smart customer. And when your customer gets really smart about it, now he has no fear about it. Now you have options laid out for them, and they trust your option. And the most important thing that can build trust in your business is being transparent. But all the time we go give sales talk, this is the best, this is the best, that is the best. We give biased information sometimes, like salespeople. But customers like unbiased information. You know, trust is very important, isn't it? It's actually above love. If your wife tells you, I love you, but I don't trust you, you know what it means. And the same thing with business. Trust is the most important thing. And one of the best things where you can build trust with customers is by being transparent. You know Berkshire Hathaway and the success story of Warren Buffett. You know Warren Buffett, each of his share of the Berkshire Hathaway sells more than one lakh rupees above one lakh rupees. They don't manufacture anything. They're into production. They don't do any of this manufacturing. What do you think so much of value for a company? And what do you think people trust that company? Interesting thing about that company is that if you really look at their annual sales report for the last eight to ten years, the first page will talk about the goof-ups they have done that year. They start with the mistakes they have committed that year. They're so transparent with their shareholders. They're so transparent with the people. This is the mistake that we did this year, and this is what we have learned. And then comes the story of several successes that comes afterwards. So people like people who have got great integrity, great transparency, and that's a great way you can build trust in your business. And sometimes to build trust, you need to give a little vulnerable side of your product and sometimes a vulnerable side of your opinions. You know, sometimes let's say, Somebody wants to buy your car. So you come to your place, you have a car for sale. And that person comes and you tell that person, you know what, there's a dent in the car. Which that person wouldn't have noticed. But then you say that first. What will happen? How do you build a rapport with the other person? Does he trust you? He trusts you more, right? Because you are shown a little vulnerability of your product to that person. And that's one of the best tools to build trust in today's business world. Instead of giving biased information, this is the best, this is the best, this is the only thing, you also, to build trust, you also show the vulnerabilities and trans being, being transparent with your customers. Because once you are transparent with your customers, they trust you. Then they buy from you. So, to make the shift, since we are here on the way of creating that breakthrough, we need to work on what works. That is smart work. Work on more things that is working. And stop doing those things which is not working. But the problem is we are all habituated. We all have habits. We have been doing that for long, so we tend to continue to do that, even if it is not working for us. Now this is where you need to draw the line and drop those things that's not really giving us any results. Work on what works and focus on the majors. The majors. Some people, you know, they focus on the minors and they get minor results. But, you know, the success stories of many people here, I believe, could be focusing on the majors. Time to think differently. Look out for innovative ways, as you have said. Thinking outside the box, you've already done that. Share those information with people different ways you have acquired a new customer, uh, how you have gained more business. And if you are not having a strong footprint online, 
And if you are not an expert advisor in the online world, they will go to those who are in the online world. So the word of mouth has become very strong. It has replaced word of mouth. So you've got to have a very strong presence on the internet as an expert, to project yourself as an expert, as a consultant, to somebody who educate your prospects for free. And those tools are very, very useful to make yourself to sound like an authority on your domain. The old ways, we are very comfortable with the things we have been doing. We go to the same clients. We ask for several from the same clients. We work with that territory, which is comfortable for us right now. It's time to get into different psychographics and demographics, different types of people, people who didn't have been approached before, different type of people, territories. Get into those things which is very more uncomfortable. Because if you want to have more of those things, what others don't have, you should be willing to do things what others are not willing to do. That's the catch. If you're willing to do what others are not willing to do, you'll have everything what others don't have. It's all about breaking that comfort zone and doing things differently. Which one is the most uncomfortable for you? Go do that first. Instead of working with limited knowledge, sharpen your axe. There's a saying, you know, if you have seven hours to chop down a tree, spend six hours just sharpening the axe. Information is the key. Today we live in what is called conceptual age. We don't manage information. We create information. And the way data is multiplying, it's going in petabytes. And this information, everybody is seeking information right now in the online world. And you should have your information right there. It's important that you take yourself into the cyberspace because two types of life, physical life and digital life, that's the kind of life people lead today. The digital life, the social media life. Instead of getting into limited action, get into massive action plan. I want to give you a success secret of the most successful people on this planet. It's very simple. They take massive action. And success is a numbers game. You believe that? You believe that success is a numbers game? It is a numbers game. So if you want to create more success, this borderline comes to the same principle. It's the numbers game. It's again going back at the numbers. The number of prospects you have, the number of closes you make, number of territories you work, number of people who work with you, or number of branches you have, the number of time, hours you put into it. You know, there's a saying that average companies would have a, what is called a CCT. CCT means customer contact time. The actual time customer and the salesperson spend the time with a customer, CCT, for most of the average companies is less than two hours. You agree on that? They spend less than two hours with a customer and they expect magical results. They work eight hours a day. It's a way if you want to increase your productivity, you have to increase customer contact time. The real physical time or cyber time that you spend time with your customer, you've got to increase that time. Increase your CCT, and sometimes you can measure it within your organization. How much of real customer face, face time you have? You've got to increase on that customer contact time. A lot of other things that you could do is that if your customer is in the negotiating environment, if you put people on a fluffier chair, softer chair, it's easy to negotiate with those people. So scientifically it's been proven, if you put your customers on a hard furniture, they're going to be very stiff. But if you put them on a very soft furniture, they tend to be easily persuaded. So success is a numbers game. So all those successful people has put in those numbers to become number one. That's why... <laughs>
So what's the industry average? How many numbers does it take to close a deal? Huh? 25. Yes. But how many people could really make that 25 calls? You know, there's a rule called the rule of 10,000 hours. It's in a book called Outlier. Outlier by... Uh, Malcolm Gladwell says those who are top in their industry would have almost spent 10,000 hours already in that area to become the best at what they do. That's the kind of time, energy, hours of work, efforts and activities they put in to get those numbers to get to the top. So the question is, are you taking massive action or are you just taking early action? If you want massive results, we need to go things massive. There's no other way. Because that's the way it works. Taking massive action. So are you ready to break your barriers? Okay, I want you all to give a tight clinch. Okay, all you take your fish and I want you to, to give a tight squeeze. As hard as you can. Okay? When I say count to three, you give the best squeeze ever. Okay? One, two, three, squeeze! Now you can do better than that. Come on. One, two, three, squeeze more! Squeeze more! Let's give a final squeeze. Squeeze more! Final squeeze, the best squeeze ever. Squeeze! Okay, question. What happened with the first one and the last one? Is there any difference? Huh? But I asked you to give the best squeeze first. But did you give the best squeeze? Huh? So you can always squeeze more, right? It's all up here. It's all up here. We can do it. So what happens when you squeeze a lemon? Lemon juice. The juice comes out. What's inside comes out, right? What happens when you're pressured with work? When you demand more from yourself? What happens to you? Huh? Some people get stressed out. Some people are... Some people, the quality comes out. What's inside comes out. When you demand more from yourself, what's inside comes out. If there is frustration inside you, it's the frustration that comes out. 
So secret I'm going to explain to you is that that little thing that can make a big difference. So you don't need to be 10 times smarter or 10 times better to become the best at what you want to be. All it takes, you got to be slightly better than everything else. You can be slightly better than what you've been before. You can be slightly better than anybody else. You don't need to do 10 times better, 10 times bigger. All it makes a difference is called the secret of the thin slight edge. It only takes a little thing to make a huge difference in your business. You know, in 2004 Olympics, 100 meters race with America, Justin Gatlin, that is 9.85 seconds. Francis Obikawa, 9.8 seconds, 86 seconds. We're talking about one hundredth of a second. That determines the winner from the runner-up. One hundredth of a second. In 2004 Olympics again, women's 200 meter freestyle event, Camilia Porek, Romanian, 1.58.03 seconds. We're talking about microseconds. It takes a thin, slight edge to be a champion. You, gotta be, you don't need to be 10 times bigger. A NASCAR Daytona, if you look at it, we talk about a winning difference is 0.175 seconds. And for a winner, it's half a million dollars more. That's why the Vince Lombardi, famous football coach, said, inches make the champions. So all you have to do is not huge differences. I'm not going to ask you to do re-engineering tomorrow. All the whole tomorrow, little tiny improvements that you can apply in your business that can give you a huge difference. Little things that can make a huge difference. Now, if you have a team like this, you know, winning matters in a microsecond. It's a question to ask who is your team member. Now, Kyle Busch team in the NASCAR circuit is the number one, He's one of the top. Now, the crew, he has a six people crew called the pit stop crew. There's the gas man, the tire man, the person who does the entire maneuver at a NASCAR event. They do approximately 73 maneuvers in a span of 12.12 .12 seconds. They do 73 things, you know, to make the, you know, the timing is everything in winning NASCAR. They do that in 12.12 .12 seconds. This is six professionals working together. They did an experiment. They replaced one person with an average player an average crew member. The time increased to 23.9 seconds, almost doubled. We've got to remember, just replace one person. The time doubled. They replaced two people. The time it took to complete the task became half a minute. The question here is that if you don't have a full team of professionals in your group, somebody is going to slow you down big time. And you've got to pay for it. Because it's very important that if you're an A owner, you've got to hire A plus employee. Not the B working for A, C working for B. You've got to hire people who are smarter than you. And not hire people who are like skilled, hire attitudes and teach them skills. Because skills are commoditized today. These, you can skill, you can always upgrade with people, but attitude. That makes a huge difference. The question is, who is your team member? It's so important who is your team member. Could you just walk with me, sir? Just walk with me, okay? Let's take a walk. All right, let's walk back. Now, when I said walk back and I walk faster, you picked up your tempo. Yeah, please be seated. So who is walking with you is the question. If you want to look at productivity and performance to be increased, who is the pace setter? Who is walking with you? Who is slowing you down? And who is not a professional? Are you professional? 100% professional? Okay. Have you seen the movie 300? 300, the movie 300, the story of 300. Yeah? Spartans, they go against the army of 100,000, 300,000 Persian army and they defeat them. It's not just a movie, it's actually a historical event. If it is blood you seek, you're welcome to join us. But you bring only this handful of soldiers against Xerxes? 
I see I was wrong to expect Sparta's commitment to at least match our own. Doesn't it? You, there. What is your profession? I'm a potter. And you, Arcadian, what is your profession? Sculptor, sir. You? Blacksmith. Spartans! What is your profession? You see, old friend, I brought more soldiers than you did. That's with being a professional. So what's your profession, guys? What's your profession? Everybody, say it loud. What's your profession? Are you proud about your profession? Then why don't you say it? What's your profession? I hope you all understand our profession, but being a professional, that gives us the results. So guys, uh, friends, it's not about, you know, the tragedy in life is actually not aiming low, aiming high, aiming high and missing it. The real tragedy in life is that you aim low and you hit it. That's the big tragedy. So we need to raise the bar, think differently, move upward, work together, share information, and try to demand the best from ourselves. Because those people who demand more from yourself, they become achievers. Very often we don't get to see people demanding from dirt from you, but you need to demand it from ourselves, us doing that. So I wish you all good luck on the year ahead. So I hope you're going to really break the barrier. So are you ready? Yeah. We could just spend a couple of minutes for Q&A if you have questions or anything that you haven't understood or any points that you want to share about, talk about. Q&A. Couple of questions, yeah. Anybody? Okay. Yeah, over there. All right. Yep. Hello. Uh, thanks, Paul, for such a motivating and enlightening uh, presentation. Uh, there were many things that I got from your uh, presentation, but the last thing which you mentioned about the teamwork, that was the most fascinating thing which I got. Uh, the dilemma is, how do you get the right people? So you spoke about those numbers, 12 seconds, 12.12 seconds, and if just one team member is not the right, you know, the productivity goes down. How do you choose the right team member? That's it's only about higher attitudes and teach them skills. Not just hire skilled people and trying to teach them attitudes. It's very, it's, if you can have an eye to catch people who are passionate about what they do. People like to play in that area instead of working at it. People who love to do it instead of they have to do it. And people who it comes easy for them. And when a job is easy for somebody, it's no more a job, it's more like a play. Is playing. He's not working at it. It's like a natural flow. If somebody you talk about a people person, how a per people person would be? What would be his attitude be like? So you need to look at hiring talents of that kind, people with great attitude. And then teach them skills because people with great attitude, they're ready to learn more. And then practice. You have to work together to get the pace. And the more practice, the more practice that you teach them. You know, you have to hire them and you have to you know, teach them how to do it. 
Because in the training and development, it's like this. First you do it, you get a new person, ask him to watch you do it. The next time, let him do it, and you watch him do it. Next, let him do it. Then next, you send somebody else with him to watch him do it. They start with you do it, somebody else, you watching you do it, and you let that person do it. That's how, you know, you learn, you teach the process. Yeah. Over there. Uh, see, thanks uh, on behalf of the audience here for a very excellent exposition which will enable us to bring the best from out of us. And I just want to add two things to what you said. I want to quote Jawaharlal Nehru who once said, Success comes to those who dare and act. See, this is, this is Jawaharlal Nehru. Another very interesting anecdote is about Thomas Batter, you know, the founder of the Batter Shoe Empire. He sent first his salesman to Africa to explore the market for shoes. And the first gentleman came back and said, there is no market in Africa, nobody wears shoes. Then he sent another A salesman who went there and said, great market, and in there nobody wears shoes. I just want to share this with the... Ultimately what gets result is action, right? We know knowledge is only potential power. Knowledge is not power. You can be the